So that's my team. So any questions for any of us? I think it would be a good idea to stand in the light, even though. <laughs> I'm, I'm, so, I'm so impressed with the elegance of your ways of collecting information. It's, it's fascinating and terrifically impressive. And looking at that and then looking at the experiences in the cave with simulations and seeing how the interface works between people and environments. As an architect, the next step for me would be to have people, not in virtual environments, but in real environments, using these technologies, walking around and capturing saccade movement, which has been done for a number of uh, things, but would be terrific to see for architecture. As architects, it would be wonderful to be able to know what people are really looking at. So when we design things, we know it's effective. Good question. I, th I think as, as, as wearable health technologies evolve, as wearables evolve, I think the, the opportunities to do that are, are going to be infinite. I think that's, that's clearly going to happen. I think uh, a lot of people are working on uh, the ability to measure these things unobtrusively. You know, even more people are thinking about once those abilities exist, what opportunities they avail. And so I guarantee there's probably someone already up in Mountain View, California, you know, with a startup doing something like that. <laughs> Yeah, so one of the things that we are actually playing with, uh, as you probably suspect, is with the Google Glass, you know, which has a camera uh, and a microphone, you can set it up so that when you detect some trigger, you can start taking pictures, you can start recording a video of what is it that happened that ca caused this stress or, you know, produced this moment of bliss for you. So you can build a much richer stream of information on what is it that works. So just as you say, you can be walking around as opposed to being in a contained environment and record the outcomes. at as they go and you know it's not commonplace but it's it's getting more and more so but I think your devices would be a, a, a better better way to measure that than simply wearing one of these near infrared jobs and walking down the hall I think we have a question here in front yep the trouble with these uh, data streams of course is if there is a lot of it uh, you know it's this needle in a haystack problem. You have hours and hours of video. You have to go out and figure out what, where's the interesting stuff. Hi. Thank you for taking this question. The cognionics, that is a very, very cool piece of equipment. Thank you. Now, I would love to be uh, intertwined with that, but I'm finding that even though I do find the opportunity to do experiment with, with people, how do I interpret the data from the EEGs? That's actually a great question, and um, that's kind of the other half of, uh, of what we do. Well, not what we do, but kind of the field we work in. So we work with uh, very smart people, people probably that are smarter than me, that are actually able to tease out information from the EEG. Um, one of the challenges with the EEG is that, uh, as you may or may not know, it's, it's a coarse signal because you're sensing signals from billions of neurons that are propagated to a few sensors you pick up on the scalp. And um, the literature shows you can definitely get you know, useful information such as attention, engagement, um, that sort of thing. But to do that, you need some pretty powerful analysis tools, as well as clean data, um, especially in real environments. And that, that is an, an area of active research, and there are people that I could probably refer to you if you wanted to take a look at the signal processing side. I'm, I'm just wondering, for the subjects of your experiments, for example, the person who had to imagine left and imagine right, what is the experience like? Do they have to continuously imagine left? Or if they imagine left and then stop thinking about it for a second, does it move someplace else? Uh, right. Uh, great question. Great question. So the good news is that what we're picking up on is something that relates to your anatomy and how your brain works. So it's well known that basically there's this you know, contralateral effect so that when I engage in a right movement, the left part of my motor cortex is active and vice versa. And so we have multi-electrode array all over the head. And so by doing some uh, pattern analysis, we can determine based upon is there more energy on this side or that side, you know, what was the likelihood or the probability that you imagined left or right. And then what we do, uh, you know, Mike was alluding to, we, we spend a lot of time developing um, some signal analysis algorithms to 
to be able to re reduce so that the amount of time that you need to imagine left or right is as small as possible before we're very confident about what it is that you've done. And so, we, and so the, the effect ultimately is that uh, your left or right imagination is, is, is about a fraction of the second. And uh, you bring forth some interesting questions about, again, the user interface design. How do we notify you that we have done a classification so now you don't have to imagine anymore because that induces a lot of cognitive load. So there's, uh, as you can see, there's sort of this combination of the applied math, the neuroscience, but also the user interface, and they all have to come together. Uh, but ultimately, it's how it works. Where we start is we train the system. Namely, we tell you up front, imagine left for a little bit. Okay, now imagine right. Do that a couple of times, so then we can pattern match and sort of, you know, to figure out what parameters best relate to your brain, and then we're operating in real time, and based upon those parameters, we just uh, 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 do, the, do the classifications. And it's very rapid, it's fr fractions of a second to, to elicit one or another. Uh, hi, I'm Melissa Marsh. Thank you all for your presentations. Um, I very much enjoyed it um, and am interested to see where things are going next. You talked often, all of you, about us learning more about ourselves through these uh, technologies. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on Google buying Nest, Intel buying Basis, and Facebook buying Oculus Rift in terms of who is the owner of this emerging data. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a question we need to have over a glass of wine. Um, yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating question. I mean, is Google ultimately going to be our insurance company, right? Uh, I mean, there's so, so many interesting questions that I don't have the answer to. Uh, my guess is that there's always unintended consequences when we do this on the downside, but there's typically also unintended consequences on the upside. And so I'm inherently an optimist. And, you know, although those nefarious types of things can take place. Let's hope that, you know, we will all be able to uh, enable ourselves in new ways and uh, we'll all benefit. And I want to add to that that, um, that uh, for instance, the Oculus Rift, there are a lot of competitors out there to it, um, not only the other big companies, but there are also small startups that make devices that are very similar. Um, the technology in the Oculus, for instance, or in the Nest is not necessarily magic, magical. There's a lot of um, engineering that went into them. Um, but that can be done by other people as well, the, especially the Oculus Rift arena. I know very well virtual reality has been around for a long time. Um, and there are a lot of other people that are doing similar things. So I want to say that if, let's say, Facebook decides to just completely dismantle the Oculus Rift and not do anything with it or do things that we don't want them to do with, someone else is going to step up to the plate and do the things that we do want to happen with the technology. So I'm. I'm I'm an optimist about this. I'm not too worried about them buying up, you know, the future. So, uh, on a pessimistic note, having played, uh, <laughs> I didn't mean it that way. Uh, having played with devices and data that are available on the market, what I've observed is over the last uh, five years, uh, there are more stovepipes that have been created rather than more data sharing, uh, and there's also an asymmetry. The data that they suck out of you. Uh, has more information than what they feed back to you through cool visualizations, right? So in some ways, they are learning a lot more about you than they even share with you back. And you have to be sufficiently knowledgeable to even understand that because you know it's all very slick. Uh, so I think everybody wants to monetize data. Everybody thinks data is gold. And in the process, I think uh, I'm actually a little bit more alarmed than I was at the beginning. I think black box formulae that process proprietary, in proprietary ways and come up with some answer, I think are scary to me because they may be wrong. Very often they apply to subpopulations. They don't apply to the whole population. And you can ba get, get badly misled by the data that comes out. So I would love to be able to have at least a requirement that information that is obtained from you is given back to you in the full fidelity with which it was gathered. So I, I just like to add a cynical note um, to these guys. Um, with these companies, just remember, the users, you're not the users, you're the product. And may I add a uh, positive note, uh, <laughs> an applied note? I, I, I just wanted to encourage the architects and designers in the room that indeed this team that stands before you and many others of us have applied these technologies to practical uh, applications and innovations in real buildings that have raised out of the earth to support what we are here for 
which is to create spaces that serve mankind better. So um, with Jurgen and Mike and others, we developed an eye tracking system that we can use both in the virtual and in real worlds with this objective of finding out what we really see and what really matters and whether we're really lost. Um, and we have taken the principles from neuroscience and adapted it into guidelines for design. And so we're at the edge of technology, but also at the edge where if we use Ramesh's um, principle of finding out what the people say, finding out what the users say about their own state, then that task that many architects have of understanding the human themselves in space is part of the secret sauce that even perhaps the technology isn't connecting, collecting. Do you, do you have a question or a comment? Oh, oh hi. Uh, my name is uh, Bertoli, and I have, uh, I have a question. I would like to bring practicality. I'm an architect, uh, and I so practice, and I also teach. And I would like to get all this uh, information that we have today, maybe at the two levels. Would it be possible that all this investigation that you're doing and exploration just in, in, in the lab, could it be done in a building? You know, we have done buildings. Could it be that you, somebody walks through the building A and building B and you get the results in terms of the emotional responses, in terms of the sense of bliss or totally <laughs> freaked out because the space is awful? Uh, to, to get that response, that will be the, the real application to the architectural practice. And the second part, at the educational, pedagogically, uh, could it be that, not that the students imagine things, right? I mean, uh, right now, somehow, they are the tools, uh, models, and drawings, and all those kind of things. And that's what has been done for the last 10,000 years in architecture. Some major milestones have occurred during that period of time. But more at the understanding the evaluation, if the student can understand what is the consequence of what they are doing right now, if it were somewhere to introduce these measurements into the process of design, and then when the things are done. Uh, you know, your, your first question about, you know, can we you know, put these things in real environments and measure people? Oh, I think the answer is yes. You know, with Google Glass, with these different wearables, they can already, you know, communicate wirelessly and do different things. We're doing a lot, a lot, a lot of that in our research. But one of the things that I'm learning that's really important, and I think a lot of the companies in the private sector are learning this too, is that uh, a lot of wearables that just continuously uh, measure you have this problem of long-term adoption in that... Um, if the user doesn't really see what the value add is, they might wear it for a little bit. It's kind of cute. You get it as a Christmas gift, but by New Year's Day, you know, it's on the shelf. And so I think what we need to think very carefully about is if, if we're trying to get someone to wear this all of the time, what is the value proposition for them? How is this going to benefit them? And in keeping that in mind, I think the capabilities are already here. Yeah. But it's really getting people to continue to use it because of the value proposition. <coughs> So I'm, I'm going to make sure I understand your question. What I almost hear is, uh, like in business school, they tell you to identify what the what the need is, and you deliver it. But Steve Jobs was such a genius that he, you know, told you what you needed. What I almost hear you saying is that uh, architects are kind of like Steve Jobs. They might differ a lot than what the average person might think of how to use a space, but in some situations, they end up being right. Is, is that what I hear you saying? That's a sort of positive slant on it. Yeah. <laughs> the, the other slant is that, that apparently different parts of the architect's brain are working from an ordinary person's brain when they look at a building because they have a lot of concept, a lot of education, and they may or may not come up with better solutions. But this information that you're talking about could mean that they become infused with a real appreciation of how people right. experience and respond. To it, it augments <laughs> their <laughs> understanding. Yeah. Um, I, think, I think what the gentleman is trying to say um, is that architects are known to have high spatial temporal rationalization skills, which is a cognitive performance, uh, whereas maybe a lawyer would have high verbal uh, communication skills. Um, and so a lot of times we're at a, an impasse with the client where mm -hmm. we may be able to virtualize in our head the degree of what uh, Jurgen's presentation was 
proposing that could be done with these 3D immersive environments, digital env en environments. And so I think then what Jurgen's technology and the technology you guys are also, that the rest of you are also presenting, is it gives the opportunity for the architect to better communicate with the client. Because ultimately, the good, we, we do tend to be right with our spatial temporal predictions, but uh, when, when, when we can have access to sort of these 3D environments and uh, virtual environments where we can put the client into such a, a place, then that we can share what it's gonna be like. Whereas right now, we know what it's like and the client's struggling to figure out why it has to be that way. And uh, I think when they're in, the, in that environment, they can start to pick up on why uh, why that thing has to be positioned that way and why we have to spend extra money to have that curve there. And, and so anyways, I, I think I just, I, there was no question. I just wanted to follow up on what the, the last gentleman said and I just wanted to commend you guys again. So not to be too facetious, but maybe someday architecture will become a service. You pay for <laughs> lack of stress and you let the architect do whatever they want to do and you measure if they delivered and you pay them accordingly. Uh, my name is Steve Shiver. I'm an architect from Seattle and uh, uh, on the leadership group for the AIA Committee on Architecture for Education. And sorry, I'm not asking a question either, and I'm not as smart as most of the other architects in this room either. I'm usually wrong. Um, but, but I wanted to say one of the reasons I was here is I, I think this research is really good because I think Part of our responsibility as architects is to not necessarily to tell our clients what to do, but to educate our clients. I mean, we're a leader of a group of, of d designers and engineers and really are leading our client and trying to help them understand what they don't know. And uh, the observation I was going to make is Tom um, presented at a couple of our conferences and he he showed Marie Antoinette's bedroom and he showed the glass house and he was explaining about how long it takes the brain to kind of adjust from this really complex environment to a really simple one. And I use that a lot in school design in convincing teachers that kids aren't distracted by interior transparency. The reason I'm saying this is I'm is it's these little tidbits I think that we can get by working together that will really help us as architects design environments that better respond to what the users of those environments are trying to accomplish. Hi, uh, my name is Aisha Ghazanfer, and my question is regarding when you uh, conduct such experiments with such devices, like what are we looking at in terms of a substantial amount of time that we can repeat the experiment again and again and we can have the same results? What I'm worried about is would it be kind of like an habituation of that thing would take place and we might not get the same reading or kind of the, the subject becomes conditioned to that same repeated trial and we are not getting the right results? Um, that's a good question. I think uh, that's a, in general that's a that's a, a, an observation. Right, if you run the same experiment over and over again, you'll probably get a different response. Um, but having said that, I think probably press, more presently today, the main problem is that you don't get a meaningful full response at all because either the tools to measure the, um, the the phenomenon don't exist, or that the tools to measure it are so cumbersome and difficult to use that you're actually altering the conditions of the experiment. You're not getting the natural response of the user. So that's a good point. I think uh, once we get past that initial step, I think you know that's a, that's a matter of designing good experimental protocols and having enough subjects and whatnot. So I want to add to it that these technologies uh, allow you to also get away from the standard uh, randomized control trial type of experiments. You know, you can start to track specific individuals over a long period of time, as opposed to come up with population averages. So you can more sharply focus on the experience of the individuals who you care for. So even if it doesn't work for everybody, as long as it works for the people who are going to be using those spaces, you know, it might be worthwhile. So you can rethink how you gather data, more longitudinal than cross-sectional. sense for like kind of special population means like Zymers or autism when we uh, use such technologies. 
I'm sorry, we missed the first part of your question. Like if we use such technologies, like for special population, it could be autism or Alzheimer's. Um, again, what you just said, like it, it's um, like over a period of time, you're repeating it, it's more individualized. Do you think that this would be more helpful by? You know, uh, well, the short answer is yes, I think it would be more helpful. You can have a baseline, you can even track uh, progression over time uh, for the individuals uh, that you're trying to focus on. Uh, but there's relatively little data of this sort that is available. You know, there's a lot of cross-sectional data that is available, but if you want to understand what is normal for a long-term data recording, because these devices haven't existed until recently, you don't have very long-term data that you can go back and use as the golden data set. Thank you. Um, my name is Aldra. I'm an architecture student. Mine is more of a technical two questions. For example, with the brains, uh, computer interface where it's a uh, left or right only. Could you bring in a second person to collaborate and perform top and bottom commands so that you can have more possibilities for movement? And um, could that be applied to a technology well, to, like to, the to, to your first question, that was that was exactly what we were doing. So if you remember first I had a cross where there were four, but I split that into two people where one person specifying this, the other person is specifying that. So the idea is rather than having one human, if people have share a common goal, rather than having one human give a whole lot of information, have many people give a small amount of information. So that's, that was your first question. But go to, go, go to the second. Thank you. Um, and then the second, would, would that technology be applied to like the cave cat um, system to model, for example, a line and then start to make form? Potentially, uh, potentially, I think there's many applications. I would, um, yes, yes. The, the, the one thing I will say, you know, keeping myself honest, is that uh, as Mike already alluded to, uh, the, the, the electrical rhythms of the brain, the EEG, are a very, uh, they're inherently noisy signal, which means that the amount of time that it's going to take to extract a lot of information is inherently limited. There's a speed limit by Claude Shannon, right, who told us the more noisy the signal is, the longer it takes to acquire information. So depending upon what you want to do, like for example, there are some startup companies that show you that you can control a beer tap with your brain. So if you focus really hard, they're at the South by Southwest exhibit, you focus really hard and then finally, you know, you focus and the beer comes out, but that's never going to compare to just going like that. So I think it depends on the applications, what's the value proposition for getting the brain signals. I think that's something that we always keep ourselves honest about when we work on our applications. Thank you. So there's been um, some research that's been done on those who are um, in a comatose state. Have you guys worked with any of the um, biologists and, and the scientists? Um, being able to communicate with those who can't bodily move. Well, I'm gonna, I know Tom, Tom is being humble here, but there's some uh, research that came out of Tom's lab that creates the capability to do that. So one of the people that I mentioned in my slides, uh, Ricardo Gil da Costa, uh, had a result with Tom that's absolutely fascinating where they can probe lots of deep aspects of cognition totally passively without any outward behavioral response. And it builds upon research that actually was discovered here 30 years ago by some cognitive scientists. And they always hypothesized that you had to have an overt behavioral response to get these measures. Well, they recently discovered that actually you can do this without any behavioral response. And that opens up a variety of opportunities for new communication with people in those conditions. Yeah. So one last question, but I was reminded, uh, listening to your question about something I saw on, on, on the web just last night about a guy who was able to watch a Hitchcock movie and experience uh, the emotions, even though he's thought to be comatose. <laughs> one last question. Uh, OK. Uh, I was uh, thinking there could be something like um, subliminal uh, information. And that information could be uh, read by some of the devices you are designing. I mean. Uh, uh, I see a person in, in in a place, and I don't know, but I'm in love with that person, no? or uh, I feel uneasy by a child uh, trauma, and I don't know, but m the device uh, could tell me uh, there's something here that it's affecting you. Uh, I, I don't know if there are any studies on these topics. 
the, the three letter agencies, I'm sure, are doing a lot of things that we don't want to know about. <laughs> so leave it at that. <laughs> Some years ago, there was a super low tech version of what you just described. Uh, I think it was a very popular thing in Japan where you programmed this little device with what you were looking for. And if another person happened to be in a bar who was exactly what you're looking for, the two of you would buzz, you know. So you kind of knew there was somebody within you know, <laughs> earshot that you could go after. So I think we have to stop now. Thank you so much. <laughs>